So good afternoon. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. June McCash, who has just entered. As you've already heard, she was the founding director of the Honors Program back in 1973. Uh, we had a big banquet on Friday to celebrate our 50th anniversary and had, had a lot of people there. Uh, Dr. McCash served from 1973 until 1980 when she became chair of what was then known as the Foreign Languages Department. She has been a recipient of a number of MTSU awards, the Outstanding Faculty Award in 1981, uh, the Distinguished Research Award in 1996, and then the Outstanding Career Achievement Award in 2003. She holds an undergraduate degree from Agnes Scott College, as well as an MA and PhD from Emory University. She's been a fellow for the National Foundation for the Humanities, as well as the American Council of Education, and has published widely in academic journals. She is the author, co-author, or editor of 16 books, many of which, and this I think is maybe the most impressive, although maybe she finally had some time from her teaching duties. I, I know they, they sometimes interfere with publishing, but most of her books, 16 books, have been written since she retired, and they include her uh, 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 historical fiction, trilogy about a French family who settled in Jekyll Island, uh, Georgia, from France, uh, and she has twice received the Georgia Author of the Year Award. So let's give a warm welcome. Thank you. Tell you what, why don't I offer you a hand here? Thank you. Appreciate it. that. Yes. And there is a chair there if you happen to need it. Okay, great. <laughs> Didn't expect this little old lady who's come to talk to you today, did you? Uh, well, I want to tell you, I never dreamed I would be standing here 50 years later talking to a class of honors students in the Honors College building. It's such an amazing thing. I'm going to talk about how we got started. And I think you might um, appreciate more what you have here. Um, I will also say that it was not an easy journey. We survived by clawing our way upward, so to speak. And uh, one of the questions I heard when the program was founded is, why does the university need an honors program? Why honors? And it's a question I'd like to try to answer today. At the time of its founding in 1973, a fair number of people on campus thought the Honors College was elitist. They said, why should some students have more opportunities than others? And it's, I suppose, a legitimate question. There was no need for honors programs in the early years of education, because most people didn't go to college anyway. But times have changed, and so has higher education. Let's look at some of the historic reasons for that change. Uh, before I do that, I would like to um, make one point, and I don't know, I think my, my slides got slightly out of order, but there, it didn't happen until just after the 1950s. In the 1950s, uh, you, of course, you don't remember them very well, but I do. <laughs> and they were considered kind of an age of conformity. And I think that I want to show you popular culture picked up on that to a great extent. And I don't know whether any of you have read this short story or not. I think I, don't, I, think I left out a page or two of my talk here. Uh, but, oh yeah, here it goes. Oops, nope. <laughs> Sorry, this is not going the way it's supposed to go. Help! <laughs> Mine's an apple. I don't, I don't deal with the, this. I don't know what's going on here. Okay, that's what I want. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how many of you have, have read this short story, not, but it's a short story by Kurt Vonnegut that was written in, or published in 1961 called Harrison Bergeron. Has anybody read that? Good, good, good. It's a short, short story. It's only about 10 pages. 
And it was a world, it depicted a world in which being smart was a liability, not an advantage. And Harrison Bergeron was very smart. And here's how the story begins. The year was 2081, and everybody was finally equal. They weren't only equal before God and the law, they were equal every which way. Nobody was smarter than anybody else. Nobody was better looking than anybody else. Nobody was stronger or quicker than anybody else. All this equality was due to the 211th, 212th, and 213th amendments to the Constitution and the unceasing vigilance of agents of the United States Handicapper General. Well, as I said, Harrison Bergeron was very smart, but he couldn't be smarter than anybody else, so he had to wear these earphones, these headpieces, so that if he ever had creative or an interesting thought, they would buzz and he would not be able to retain that thought. If a ballerina was very talented, she had to wear weights on her so she couldn't be any more graceful than anyone else. And good-looking people wore ugly masks. <laughs> they were all the same. They were all equal, if you will. Um, and by the way, this was made into a movie in 1995. Did, did you know that? Yeah. The 1995 feature film. Well, there's no question that I think that a thriving society needs an equal opportunity for people to meet their needs and develop their capabilities. But the fact is, we don't all have the same capabilities, and those who have exceptional ability should not be handicapped because others don't share that reality. In an ideal world, I think, all should be allowed to develop their minds and talents to their greatest ability. And that is what was not happening uh, in the educational community in the 1950s. One year later, uh, a woman named Malvina Reynolds wrote a, a song called Little Boxes. This is not the entire lyrics, but I, I just put up the ones that where she mentions the university. You can't hear it, Little boxes on the hill. Little boxes made of ticky tacky little boxes, little boxes, little boxes, all the same. There's a green one and a pink one, and a blue one and a yellow one, and they're all made out of ticky tacky, and they all look just the same. And the people in the houses all went. To the university and they all got food and boxes, little boxes all the same. And there's doctors and there's lawyers and business executives and they all got food and boxes and they all come out the same. And they all play on the golf course and drink their martinis dry and they all have pretty children, and the children go to school, and the children go to summer camp, and then to the university, and they all get put in boxes, and they all come out the same. And the boys go into business, and marry and raise a family, and they all get put in boxes, little boxes. Same. There's a green one and a pink one and a blue one and a yellow one and they all make out of kicky tacky and they all look just the same. Well, that's perhaps a, an extreme uh, indication of it, but there was a strong feeling at the end of the 50s, at the beginning of the 60s, that this is what was happening. And as you know, uh, the 60s was a very different kind of age in which people tried to rebel against this kind of conformity. Well, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with conformity? Uh, well, the, what is conformity? Conformity is a, a tendency for people to align their thinking, their attitudes, and their beliefs with all the people around them. No original thoughts. You don't really need that. You just have to agree. 
And for example, in a 2021 survey of 37,000 students, I'm sorry, 80, 30,000 students at 159 colleges indicated that about 80% of college students say they self-censor some of the time, and many of them said most of the time, because they didn't want to speak out in class. They didn't want to say anything that anyone was going to disagree with. And so they felt uncomfortable expressing their views on controversial topics during a classroom discussion. It's just easier to go along with the crowd, isn't it? It's just easier to agree with everyone else. Even if you think they're wrong, you don't want to speak up and say that. Well, it may be courageous, but who wants to be different, you know? So this resistance to conformity was beginning to show itself. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, most people didn't go to college in the early years. Uh, in the 1920s, for example, there was a abundance, a new set of colleges, and what came about, what brought this about? Well, it was World War I. And we had many people who, for the first time, came off the farm and went into the war, and they saw and heard and read and experienced things that their parents had never had that opportunity to experience. And suddenly they come home, and what you know, what are they going to do? Well, a lot of them decided they wanted to go to college. We also had uh, women got the vote in 1920. And of course, that brought a lot more women, made a lot more women begin to look at their own experience and think, well, hey, I need to go to college too. And my mother was one of those. I'll tell you about her in a minute. Um, the Second World War came along. And what we had, had there was a totally different uh, situation. What was passed in 1944? Anybody know? That made it easier to go to college? G. You G. come G. back from the war? G. G. The GI Bill, right. The Servicemen's Readjustment Act, the GI Bill. And it allowed people to go to colleges and get loans for houses, <laughs> to build that ticket to as a bit, and so forth. But before World War I, there were only a few colleges where students could go. And there were places like Harvard and Princeton and Columbia and Brown. And most of them were wealthy. And they didn't go to college for reasons that people go today for the most part. I'm not throwing you into a single basket. But most people go to college today because they want to be credentialed in order to get better jobs. Is that not true? Do you not think that's why people go to college, that they, they really, for the most part, I mean, there are notable exceptions, but as the student population grew, I mean, they no longer wanted to study Greek and Latin and rhetoric and logic and all those things. Those people went to college in the, before the World War I to expand their minds and to get a, really what they call the classical education. But as the student population grew, all that changed. Um, students came, as I said, not because they wanted to be necessarily well-read and cultured, all company accepted, of course, but because they wanted to be more competitive in the job market. Well, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be competitive in the job market. It's just that an, ex an educational curriculum is normally designed with the average college student in mind not the brightest and the most promising. Over time, more colleges were founded. The curriculum became increasingly attuned to the masses of people who were going to those colleges. And the, that classical education got kind of watered down, if you, if you know what I mean. So here we are. Coming back from the war, and then another, another situation event happened. Uh, we got uh, the uh, Brown versus uh, the board. I'm sorry, my pages are all mixed up <laughs> I don't know what happened to this, but um, in any case, we, we had more, more African-American students were getting better educations 
there was, there was greater equality in the schools. They were allowed to go to schools wherever they wanted, and we benefited from that by bringing more bright minds into colleges and universities. So, a lot of things, as you can see, have changed in higher education. <coughs> you wouldn't believe I went over this about 12 times before I got here. Anyway, I was going to say, uh, in 1957, something then quite remarkable happened. Uh, to spur this obvious need for more bright minds to be educated at universities. And that was the Sputnik in 1957. It was the first uh, satellite, the first man-made satellite sent into space by the Russians. Well, we had to get caught up, you know, so we had to have better uh, colleges and university. Um, <coughs> Okay, <laughs> what, what happened then? We had a gentleman, and actually this happened in the 1920s, before, uh, before the World, World War II, someone had already seen the need for that. His name was Frank Adelot, and he'd, he'd been a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford. He was president of Swarthmore College, and he's the only academic I can remember who ever got his face on the cover of Time magazine just because of his curriculum and not for some other advantage. In any case, he started a program at Swarthmore which brought him into the forefront of American colleges. And it was based on his own experience at Oxford. Uh, he had small classes, interdisciplinary classes. It all sound familiar? <laughs> well, and. The, the thing was, nobody picked up, or very few people picked up the model and ran with it because it was expensive. It was very costly to have small classes, the best professors you could get, and so forth. You had to have more classrooms, more facilities, and the selectivity of the honor students became, of course, an issue as well. But even today, he is, he is, he is remembered on the Swarthmore uh, website for his honors program. Well, by 1959, fewer than 395 students received bachelor's degrees. Oh, I do not know what has happened to my slideshow, but let me just say these things. We'll come back to Joseph. Um, <laughs> in 1969, fewer than 3, 393,000 students received a bachelor's degree, 69. In only one year, by 1870, that number had more than doubled. Over 792,000 were, were getting degrees, and it has continued to grow to more than 2 million today. As I said before, uh, among this influx of new students, the standards tended to, I won't say necessarily plummet, but they certainly were arranged to meet the typical student. Well, after Frank Adelot, there was another fellow who came along. Um, in, 19, in the 1950s, a fellow by the name of Joseph Cohen, and he picked up the banner and he founded what was called the Inter University Committee on the Superior Student. That was in 1958, only one year after Sputnik. And he began to edit a journal called The Superior Student. And in 1966, he published a uh, a book called The Superior Student in Higher Education, which really kicked off the movement to find a means to provide honors level study as an option to qualified students. 
1966, that same year, he founded the National Collegiate Honors Council. I assume MTSU is still a member of that. That was the first thing we yeah. did when we uh, we started the honors program was to join NCHC because there were colleges around the country that were beginning to pick up on these ideas and to open honors programs hither and yon. There weren't many honors colleges in one day, uh, in that day, but, but now you know there are a few. There's still not very many in Tennessee. I think there are two now in Tennessee. Is that right, John? I know we were there, the there first. Are more, there are more programs. I don't know how yeah, many there are more programs. There's, there are a number of programs, but there are not many honors colleges. Well, <laughs> okay, let me tell you a little bit about MTSU history before we go farther. It was founded in 1911 as a two-year te two teacher's college. In 1925, it became a four-year teacher's college. In 1943, it was designated a state university, I mean, sorry, state college, MTSC. And it noticed that that was during the war years, and there were a number of young men coming back from the war in after 44 who began to enter these programs. In 1951, it established its first graduate program, and in 1965, it was designated a state university, MTSU, which is where you are today. In 1973, we established the honors program. When I would come a long way from 1911 to a two years teacher's college, two year teacher's college to an honors program of the caliber that we have today, trust me on that. We didn't start out that way though. The person, that's not a great picture of Dr. Scott, it was the only one I could find online that was uh, at heavy age he was at the time he founded the college, but he became president of MTSU in 1969. And he founded the honors program in 1973. He's the one who said, I want to have an honors program here. And the, the question was, why did he pick me? Why me? And I thought about this occasionally, actually a lot. Why was I chosen as the first director? Because there were lots of other great people here. But the odds were very much against it. I was still a fairly young faculty member in my uh, early 30s. And worst of all, I was a woman. And in those days, the only administrative leaders who were female were people like the chair of COMEC, as it was called at the time. You probably never even heard of home economics, but that was where they taught you to sew and make bread and that sort of thing back in the day. Uh, it's, it's changed a great deal. It's not even called that anymore. And there are men who, who uh, take the, the course. What is it called today, John? Do you know? I <laughs> don't. I something don't like, know like human that. management or something. Does anybody yeah. know? What, yeah, human, human sciences. Human sciences. Yeah. Human sciences, yeah. human sciences human. yes. Uh, there, uh, it was, and there were, there were women in the nursing program at that time. Nursing was an almost female profession. It isn't anymore. So times have definitely changed. Uh, there was also a dean of women, which we don't believe we have anymore. But here I was, you know, cast of the wolves out there, so to speak, uh, as a fairly young young professor. Well, why was I picked? Okay, I, I don't know for sure. But one of the bedrocks of honors education, according to Dr. Cohen, was a belief in the interconnectedness of all knowledge. And that goes all the way back to Joseph Adelon as well a desire to help students fulfill their potential. Uh, inter, it, it, with interdisciplinary studies were also a large part of the honors, <coughs> honors work for him. And I had, I had gone to Emory University, and I had, I had graduated from something called the ILA, the Institute for Liberal Arts. And it was, by and large, an interdisciplinary kind of program. I did my graduate work in comparative literature, primarily, but we took courses on many, many different things, and 
When I got to MTSU, I was, I was on the faculty at, at Emory. After I got my PhD, I was on the faculty at Emory for three years, and then I came here. And I felt a sort of an intellectual vacuum on the <laughs> campus when I first arrived. I, I, you know, it was so different from, from where I had been at Emory. There's no question about that. And so the, the second year I was here, I, I decided I would organize an interdisciplinary <coughs> seminar. Well, students had to apply to take the course. They had to write an essay. We only accepted 15 students, and we had a great time. The faculty participated pro bono. They did not uh, get paid for this. They did not, it did not count on their course load, but it did count for student credit hours. And so we had the most remarkable set of students it really created excitement for us as well as for the students. One of those students went on to become a uh, congressman, uh, a U.S. congressman. One went on to become a major labor lawyer, and uh, they're just their careers were just. And I'm not saying it's all owed to that course, mind you, but it really started them thinking. I think about what was possible because the topic of the course was the individual in society. And we had people from various disciplines, history, English, math, science, uh, many departments who participated in this. Well, we kept it up, and it continued on, uh, actually until it's still going on, I think, interdisciplinary seminars, we're still doing them. But uh, faculty members were really excited to be able to interact with these bright students as well as the other way around. Well, everybody at the university was not wildly enthusiastic about this, as you might uh, imagine. Some department chairs were all eager to, were not eager, none of them, well, some were, but most of them were not <laughs> eager to participate. When I'd go to their office and ask for their very best professor to teach a course of 15 students, they would think, what, are you crazy or something? You know, I can put 50 students in a big class and I get more credit for that. Funding was based on headcount, yes. quantity, not quality. And one of, the cha one of the chairs, I remember, got very upset that I had been appointed because he said, he said to the provost, or what we call the provost today, well, it's like being a dean. She only answers to the provost and to the, to the <laughs> president. And I thought, well, and of course today that person is the dean, and, and only, after only three of us, there was the third one was made the first dean. I remember one chair in particular, when I went to his office, I wanted to do an interdisciplinary course on the impact of Freud on multiple disciplines. And I talked to a psychology professor at the place I live now, and told him what, oops, what had happened. Anyway, he, um, he said, well, you know, the guy said, that's 19th century psychology. And I said, but, you know, Freud didn't die until 1939, and he won the Goethe Prize in 1930, so that's 20th century, as I recall. His work still reverberated and does today, to a great degree, in many, many disciplines. But that was one course we were never allowed to offer. I got in that... The minute I started my spiel in his office, he went like this. Well, we all know what that means. No <laughs> way. Well, some chairs were, I'm happy to say, some chairs were eager to participate. Uh, most notably, English history and biology, to name only a few. Twelve departments, in effect, finally offered honors programs that first fall semester of 1978. Uh, with special honors sections of general studies classes, and we also had upper division senior seminars. Department participation soon grew to 18, and that was just the beginning. There's so many more today. But as I said, there was a reason. I understood what they were saying. It was quantity, not quality, that mattered. And besides, why do these bright students deserve anything that everybody can't have? I also had to fight the notion that honors was elitist. I had to sell the program by pointing out that selective admission of students 
in the band doesn't seem to be a problem. You have to have special opportunities. If you want to play football on the football team, you need special skills. Why would we deny those who want extra intellectual achievement? Why should they be held back to the level of the average student? I also argued that these were the students most likely to succeed. So I'm counting on you out there. <laughs> uh, these were students who were likely to succeed in their chosen profession and to be able to give back and enhance the reputation of the university, and they have. Our very first honors graduate, and I'm sure you've already heard this from Dr. Bob Les uh, two weeks ago, uh, the very first honors graduate was Paul Martin Jr. and he and his brother donated $2 million toward building this building that you're in now. And uh, I, I, I'm really proud of Paul for doing that because he proved me right, you know, <laughs> so don't let me down there. Uh, it wasn't just department chairs, though, and faculty members who were resistant. It was also students. Some students resisted as well. They didn't want to go in honors classes because their grade point average might drop. They were really worried about that. Uh, if they were in a class with their intellectual equals, that somehow they had to compete harder and their grades would drop. Well, as it turned out, we found out that that didn't happen at all, that what actually happened in those early days was that the minute the students walked in the door of an honors class, the professor assumed you were an A student. So you had to prove him or her otherwise. So it was the expectation that you would succeed. Um, well, eventually it was the students themselves who sold the program. Eventually, students like yourselves who go out and say, man, I'm in this cool honors program, I'm in this class, and I'm, you know, we're doing this, this, and the other. And they really, uh, they really sort of sold the program at that. But in selling program to students, we did it in, in some of the same ways that John Vile is doing it today, Dean Vile. Um, we told them that you've got the benefits and the personal attention that you might get in a small liberal arts college like Swanee. Uh, but that you have the advantages of the larger university, and those were many. We told them they would have opportunities they wouldn't have in regular classes. We told them that they would be more likely to be admitted to really good graduate programs or professional schools. We told them that they would be better prepared for competition in graduate or professional schools. We told them that smaller classes were more stimulating because there wasn't so much of that stifling your belief. People talk in honors classes, as I'm sure you well know. And they had the best professors. Well, what's, you know, what's not the like? But as I say, eventually it was the students who sold the program. Well, we had another major obstacle. I'm spending most of my time on the resistance of the obstacles, but they were real in those days. Uh, in the beginning, honors was not a well-funded program. Uh, we waited, we worked under many handicaps. I felt a little bit like Harrison Bergeron, really, you know, <laughs> unable to do what I wanted to do because I had all those handicaps. First of all, I was a half-time director, and I had to teach at least two courses and do my administrative work as well. I didn't mind that too much, but the hard part was I only had a half-time secretary and her uh, office, we started out, she was in a storage room in Boutwell Dramatic Arts Building. That was our first honors program office. Um, well, fortunately it didn't last too long. We got moved to what they then called the Drawing Building, and today that's known as the Jackson Building. And it was Okay, but it was really not great. Uh, we got, we had office, but no honor center. We had nothing that, where we could have classes or anything of that sort. So then, in the second, we moved again to the second floor of Keithley University Center. Here, at least, I had an office for myself. I had an office for my half-time secretary, as well as an honor center and a seminar room. So we were moving up in the world. 
And finally we moved into the first floor wing, one of the little pads, if you will, at the bottom that I hold up uh, Peck Hall. And there we had offices, an honor center, a seminar room, a student office, and a classroom. And this was the location I had been aiming for in, from the very beginning. So we had managed in that first eight years to move four times. Uh, and fortunately, I had, I had wonderful honor students who sort of helped out with the secretarial work as need be. Most of them had work scholarships and were delighted to work in the honors office. Well, what was it like back then? Okay, the admission requirements were an ACT score of 25 or a GPA of 3.5. I believe that's what it's the now ACT both. score is still today, is it? Yeah, not? it's both. It's, you have to have both. I don't know about GPA. Yeah. Uh, we had small classes, 20 in the lower division classes and 15 in the upper division. All this sounding familiar? We had specially designed general studies classes. We had interdisciplinary seminars. We had a thesis requirement. We had an honors council. And we had a lecture series. Now all these weren't there from the very beginning, but before I left the post as honors director, they were, that was what was in place at the time. Well, it sounds wonderful, but then I look at what we have now. Oh, we had, oh, oh, oh I left off some, okay, the lecture series, the faculty firesides. Do you still have those? Not as such. No. Uh, well, what that involved was professors inviting students into their homes and in a more informal setting and really getting to know their professors better and it was all in the context of a class, but it was nevertheless something important. And we had interdisciplinary minors. I don't know how many of those have continued, but they were things like women's studies, uh, medieval studies, and so forth. Today, <laughs> what has changed? These are the new things. You have lots more funding and resources, as you well know. You have an honors college now, not an honors program. You have a full-time dean and an associate dean. I believe they may still do a little teaching, I don't know. Uh, they have six, I'm sorry, that's seven staff members, not six. Uh, they have resident faculty members. They have an honors college building. I should be saying you have. You have an honors living and learning center. You have abundant scholarship funds, of course, with the Buchanan's especially. And you have publications like Arete and Ciencias y Vanitas. And you have a visiting honor seminar. And so all of those have been added <coughs> since those early days. I can only wish it had been like that in those early days. But it has to grow. You have to plant a seed somewhere. And things begin to grow if you're successful. Um, since the honors program began, um, oh, and by the way, I was interested in, in, I looked at the Rutherford County website, it just happened to glance at it not long ago, and the, uh, the Rutherford, County, Rutherford County website lists Dr. Scarlett's proudest achievements, one of which, he had three things that he had started, one of which was the honors program. So we felt really good about that. Um, I was interested to note that and it also added that the avant-garde curriculum was a big success and continues today as prominent on campus and I think you can certainly say the Honors College is prominent on campus. Unfortunately for the program, <coughs> Dr. Scarlett retired in 1978 and his replacement was far less enthusiastic about the Honors Program. He thought it was elitist and far less willing to provide the necessary funding to help the program grow and thrive. And it was quite discouraging. Um, I served on another two years, but at that point I decided to move in another direction. Um, 
I missed the honors program, and I'm still involved. We'll talk about that in a minute. But there have been five directors and deans, and again, this may be duplication of what Dr. Vile did, but I was the first, I was the founding director, and I came from foreign languages. Um, I think that would, was taken in my third office, that photograph is taken in my third office. Uh, Dr. Ron Messier was from history. He was an extraordinary professor who did a great deal of archeological research and who published a number of books as well, and uh, was also a very, very close friend. Unfortunately, he passed on last year. This is uh, the third one, Dr. John Paul Montgomery, who was English. He was from the English department, but he was also the first dean, and you notice how I go from, cleverly, go from black and white for the <laughs> directors to the deans in color. <laughs> uh, Dr. Phil Mathis from biology followed him, and he was from biology, as I said, and he was also a poet, and he's just come out with a new book. He's published at least two books of poetry, maybe more, I'm not sure. So you never know what, who's going to turn up. Please notice all these people are from different disciplines. And then Dr. File, whom you know well, I'm sure, came from political science, and he's written a few books, too. <laughs> well, I want to, if you'll indulge me a moment in some of my personal reflections and some of the memories I have. One of the things that we always touted in the Honors College was that these students had special opportunities and events that other students did not enjoy. This was taken, this photograph, is our congressman, our young congressman at the time, Al Gore, and he was um, invited to a class on utopias and utopian thought. And one of the assignments that the students had to do was to take an existing social problem and find what they thought was a utopian solution. And then we invited our congressman in to critique those ideas, to listen to them and critique them. And he, he, he was amazing. He, he listened very carefully and he could immediately pinpoint an issue, a problem that might be there. And once or twice he said, hmm, that's an interesting idea. Do you mind if I tuck that away for future use? We know what his future use was going to be. It didn't quite work out that way. <coughs> uh, this was uh, a man named B.F. Skinner. Again, you probably have never heard of him, but he was very prominent uh, in those days. He was known as the father of behaviorism, and he was ranked by Amer the American Psychological Association as the 20th century's most eminent psychologist. Uh, we couldn't bring him here, we didn't have the money, but I called him and said, would you be willing to do a telephone interview with my students? We, it was, we didn't have Zoom in those days, but this was the equivalent of Zoom. You, you could boom out the telephone and the students could ask him questions and everything. And he had written a number of books, but the one that we had read was called Walden Two. Anybody read that? Yeah? Uh, and he agreed, he agreed to do it. He said, normally I don't do this, but he said, I'm very fond of that book. And so he came and had interacted with the honors students in that class, and again, it was just an amazing experience for the students, for all of us. And I think it was an amazing experience for him. He really enjoyed it. This one uh, was, <laughs> We were doing an interdisciplinary seminar called Film Reflections of a Changing World. I don't know how many of you are in mass media out there, but it's, it's amazing. I started with the mass, with mass media with the, to show you what, how those, those conformities were recollected in, in the early 60s. But this is Janet Gaynor. She was in the very first version of A Star is Born. Now, it's been remade three times with Judy Garland, uh, Barbara Streisand and Lady Gaga, most recently. So it was considered quite an interesting story at the time. And if you look at all those films, you will see the role of woman in emerging and evolving in those. Well, we again did a telephone interview with Janet Gaynor. I'm sure she's no longer alive now. But she had made that version in 1937, even before I was born. So you can imagine. Then we went 
to, we, this was the kind of thing we told the students, you know, you're not going to get to do that in a freshman biology class, there are too many of you and so forth. But in, in the honors biology classes, students got to learn to use the electron microscope. And that was a pretty big deal for science majors. By the way, Dr. Mathis was the teacher of that course, so he had some experience. This one uh, was an interesting course as well. This was taught by two people, one of whom was Dr. Bart McCash, who was my, my former husband but has died since then. And this is Dr. Messier, who has also passed away, who's teaching this particular one. But if you'll notice, all the students, maybe not all of them, some of them just dressed in ordinary clothes. I assume they're more modern people. But you see Pharaoh standing in the background, and you see a, a queen and various and sundry characters there. And what they did was they would become these historical characters for the semester. And it was their, their purpose to learn everything they could learn about the growing up, the policies, everything they could find out about the personal lives and the professional lives of these characters. And then they would debate with the other characters. And it was, very, it was very enriching, I think, for everybody because they got to see how things had evolved. They got to see how things, um, how different, different countries, different mindsets viewed things and so forth. So this was a particularly interesting one. Now the next one, <laughs> this was a course on the medieval experience. Believe it or not, that's me on the white. <laughs> we were all quite surprised. The students uh, prepared the banquet. They did all the... Oh, rat. Sorry, I forgot to turn that off. Uh, it, it was... It, but the students had prepared a surprise for us. Uh, Dr. Ron Messi and I team taught the course. Again, that's something that normally wasn't done, but we, we did it in the honors college. Oh, I was programming, I'm sorry. And uh, they had baked <laughs> the equivalent of 40 blackbirds in a pie. They were just little chickens, and there weren't 40 of them, I assure you. <laughs> but they had to caution Dr. Messi not to cut into the pie. So <laughs> it was a big, as you can see, it was a big surprise for everybody. But it was a wonderful, a wonderful experience. Uh, the medieval banquet was the, uh, the highlight, the, the culminating point of the class. But we, uh, we did many other things. We took the students, Ron took uh, the, the male students to uh, 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 an abbey uh, for a weekend. I took the female students to a convent, and they got to experience what life was like for women and, and men who, who, uh, who were, took up a profession in the church. And that was very, very common for women, especially. Um, so that was a really fun course, I can certainly, certainly tell you. Well, but most of it was about the students. This was a young man named Michael Gigandic, and since Commerce Union Bank is no more, I assume this, this uh, award is no longer given. And it wasn't a huge award, I think he maybe got $100 or something like that, but for us in the honors program, that, that day and time, this was a big deal. And, uh, he was the first, and you can see it's, I don't know if you still have that plaque or not. No? No. no uh, oh my goodness. With, I'd love to find it though, if, if we have it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you see, they threw it away, our archive. <laughs> 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 and the second photograph here I have is of Paul Martin, the left. And he was MTSU's first graduate with university honors, and the one who, with his brother, donated $2 million for this building. Now the building had to be matched. I'm sure again, you talked, I probably am just duplicating everything you said. No. I was supposed no. to go first, but you know, no. <laughs> in any case, uh, it, it was, uh, he was a promising student. There were others who were equally, if not more promising, but he's the one who still today is involved with the Honors College. He serves on the uh, on the board, the visitors, board of visitors, and uh, he is, uh, he certainly takes an interest in everything you do, trust me. Gina, may I make a comment real sure. quickly? He's, we just published a book on the 50th anniversary, and we have that picture in there, and when I saw him Friday at our banquet, 
He said, look at that. He said, that... It, he said that was a check for a hundred dollars. <laughs> so the, the point is you don't have to wait till you get two million dollars before you start contributing to the honors college. Right. Well, that's right, you don't. <laughs> and, and probably most of us couldn't do that. Um, but I want to say that the honors doing beginning this this is this is the last slide. All of this was just the beginning. And it has meant so much to me to have been a part of this program. It's, I think it's my, my, even though it was slow going and sluggish and we had to fight every battle at the time, it was worth it. And I am so proud of what the Honors College has become today. I'm so proud to still be involved. Uh, I serve as an honorary member of the visiting committee and I do come to most of the meetings. Um, and I don't know how much longer I'll be able to do that, but I still do now. And uh, I taught a, a course on uh, writing historical fiction, two of those visiting seminar courses right before the COVID epidemic. And so I really do care about you guys. And I'm so happy. I, I live at Adams Place now. It's a retirement uh, community. And I'm in independent living at Adams Place. And some of you come out once a month to help, to do whatever you can. Us poor bumbling people with the technology <laughs> and so forth. But uh, we, we certainly appreciate you and all the things that you have done. And we promise, I made big promises back in those days, so guys, don't let me down. <laughs> Make us proud. <laughs> and I'm going to leave the open for a few questions if you have any. You may not. I may have just dazzled you with my brilliant presentation <laughs> and mixed up pages. I don't know how that happened. Yes? Well, I had a comment to make. Um, Do you have a question? Well, I had a comment. Um, Can you speak a little louder? Well, I may have to have an interpreter here. <laughs> the, the reason that I chose MTSU was because of the honor. She said the reason she chose MTSU was because of the Honors College. You did? You chose MTSU? How many of you did choose MTSU because of the Honors College? I suspect a lot of you chose it because it was not as expensive as some other <laughs> But I think you're getting your money, whatever you're paying and whatever your scholarship funding is. We are so fortunate today to have the 